All right, it's 8 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank everyone for attending the uh, Public Safety Subcommittee on Appropriations uh, for the House. And I have Chairman Hupstetter with me today. He's going to also be chairing uh, from his position in the Senate. It's a privilege to have a joint meeting so that we can expedite review um, and consolidate our hearings on the amended 2016 budget. Um, this will allow us to move through that and get a budget document out for a vote by the full committee and then on to the House floor and then to my colleagues in the Senate so they can also review it and hopefully have this finished up quickly in the next few weeks. Um, the, of course, everyone here is aware that the, the larger budget, the 2017 budget, is more complicated, has more, more to it um, as it should because it starts, the, uh, starts off the 2017 fiscal year. Um, with that, I'm going to ask if the chairman would like to say a few words, and then I'm going to take role in our committee. Well, it's great. Go ahead. It's great to be here, and um, we appreciate all the work that's gone into uh, criminal justice over the last several years and look forward to continued improvements. And uh, we'll be uh, questioning a few things, and I'm sure you guys will have all the answers. <laughs> All right, so on our committee uh, this morning, I want to note that we have um, Bill Hitchens is here, Dusty Hightower is here. I know Tom Weldon is absent because of a fun funeral. Uh, Mr. Atwood is here. Uh, Mandy Ballinger is here. Judge Caldwell is here. And I see your Senator Lindsey Tippins is here. All right, well, good. Well, we'll get started then. I didn't miss anybody, I don't think. <clears throat> All right. We'll go ahead and get started. If we could, uh, if we could hear from the Department of Corrections first, Commissioner Bryson, uh, Greg Dozier, the De uh, Chief of Staff, if you all would come up to the podium. Let me turn this on. And uh, we'll hear from you. This morning I'd like to try to, um, given that the requests in the FY16 budget are somewhat slim, let me ask you to present that first. We'll take any questions on that particular, the, the smaller budget and the amended budget and then after that if there are no questions or if we have time remaining we'll go ahead and go into the 17 budget I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to knock out both this morning um, if we need you to come back because there are a lot of questions or questions arise thereafter then we'll certainly call you back at a later date during the session but I want to thank you both for being here and thank you for the work you're doing for the Department of Corrections thank you go Mr. Ahead, Mr. Chairman it's a pleasure to be here and good morning to everybody uh, just glad we're not in ice and snow to begin this session like we have a, seems like way too often the past few years uh, we we've, we've pr have a PowerPoint presentation in front of you and we're just going to work from that PowerPoint presentation uh, it's a Department of Corrections amended 1617 Five years ago, uh, the predictions for corrections in the state of Georgia were that we were, uh, were trending to have 5,000 additional inmates in our facilities uh, by 2016, which would have required uh, the construction of two new prisons at a cost of $264 million. And thankfully, uh, due to the efforts of uh, the governor and the nearly unanimous support of the House and the Senate, uh, that's not the case any longer. Um, looking at slide two, talking about just numbers, you can see how our numbers have decreased over the last few years. And uh, the good news is that our prison population over the last two to three years has, has been relatively stable and and that is in light of an increasing population in our state so i think that's pretty significant to note looking at uh, slide three referencing commitments you can see that our commitments have continued to decline in fact they're the lowest in 2015 that they have been since 2002. our recidivism rates are trending in the right direction on slide four uh, we continue to look at that, and we, uh, we're uh, cautiously optimistic of what we're doing with our programming within the facilities. And I want to publicly say uh, we're thankful that we have the working relationship that we do with the new agency, the, 
Department of Community Supervision and with the Pardons and Parole Board. <coughs> Jail subsidies, these used to be uh, a big uh, bone of contention. Uh, just three years ago, we had 4,400 inmates in county jails that were awaiting pickup to come into the correction system at a cost to taxpayers of over $25 million. And as you can see, those numbers now are, are really neg negligible. Less than 300 people awaiting pickup now. <clears throat> Slide six, uh, referencing violent versus nonviolent prison trends. Uh, sort of the, one of the tenets of criminal justice reform is to divert those nonviolent offenders from coming into the prison system on the front end and, and divert those to the accountability courts for other programming options. Uh, been very successful with managing numbers uh, as a result of that. And I think it's uh, an intended result of that, quite frankly, is that the percentage of inmates within the prison system are more violent than they've ever been before. And for us as an agency, that causes us some concerns. And uh, one of those has been with our facilities and over the last several years, and we'll continue to ask this year for some uh, funds to harden our facilities uh, so that it's more difficult for inmates to tear up infrastructure and to use it to construct weapons. And also the more violent prison population causes us uh, concerns for our employees, and it really heightens the necessity to have an experienced, well-trained, and vigilant security staff. Now looking at uh, the specific budget recommendations, <clears throat> relative to FY16, we only have one recommended change and it's an increase uh, to cover the cost to comply with the new federal reporting requirements and that increase is only or is $135,293 and that's on page 88. And that is the only change in amended 16 for the Department of Corrections. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. And so uh, we're on page 88 of, this, of your governor's budget book, this, the FY16 amended. Um, and we'll be working off of that right there. And then for the 17 budget, just for, we'll be working off of page 159. But let me ask a question, Mr. Commissioner. On the jail subsidy, where are we to date in terms of the expenditures for your jail subsidy, your county jail subsidy? Uh, we, uh, that has increased, uh, what, we, what have we paid out this fiscal year, Scott? $600. $600 is what we paid this out. Year. This year? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. I might, for some reason, I had thought you had said in the in the big in the presentation of the full committee that it was around four thousand, but it's six six hundred dollars what we paid out to date. Okay, yes. all right. And then the other question I had was that that's very impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's very impressive because I think you told us before that the um, in the slide shows that it was substantial it was in the millions of dollars. I think before um, twenty five million. Is, we were, is the drop off, and that's that's with removing the, the inmates out quicker and faster. Um, and, and, and was I mistaken and that's a technological adjustment that's, that's helped facilitate that's, that, that? That has really helped facilitate that and, and, and also having the bed space within the department to move those inmates into. So it's a combination of the two. Good. Good. Um, and then another question on <clears throat> what is the what is the the payments that are made per inmate to the county um, to the county jail subsidy? Um, I think is, and, I, and I'm actually thinking of the ones that are the farm work camps that the counties are operating, so they're more regional in nature. Um, and so, if you could tell us about that subsidy compared to the subsidy that's paid for county jails, which hold state prisoners over before they're transferred into the system. There was a recent increase in the. Um county jail subsidy, subsidy for those inmates that they house over that 15-day window for us, and that has recently increased to $30 a day. Uh, the, the per diem paid into the county work camp programs is what most people refer to them as. That's $20 a day. Uh, it's been that number for a number of years. Um, 
those inmates go to those county facilities and we pay a reduced rate, but in turn, the county gets the benefit of the labor of those inmates on county projects. Uh, there is some uh, uh, recommended funding in the FY17 <laughs> budget to uh, compensate uh, those county programs for providing educational programs for, for those inmates, in addition to just work programs. And we can discuss that now, Mr. Chairman, or we can wait and discuss it with 17, whatever your preference is. Well, let's do it at 17. I want to see if there's any, mem any questions from members of the committee, um, Senate and House, on the amended budget. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Um, looking at the uh, commitments that have dropped from 2009 at about 21,600 down to 18,000, how much of that is related to uh, – sentencing changes to crime rate i mean what's your opinion on that i think it's a combination of of the the two things that you just uh, mm -hmm. uh stated mr chairman i think uh the larger percentage of it probably has to do with the legislative changes but i think certainly the crime rates uh, impact that also all right and when you talk about the um those in the county jails awaiting pickup I'm trying to remember on that. Is there a certain day that they're in there before they are listed as being yes, waiting? Ha it, how many days is that? Do you guys? We have 15 days to pick them up from the uh -huh. county once um, the re uh, the requirements for them to move to us have been met, and uh, so we start paying on the 16th day okay. if we haven't picked them up by then. So the 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 449 that was in here, and I think you said it was at 300. That's the inmates that have been there more than 15 days. No, sir. Those that's are, just want to make sure I understood that entitled, correctly. Entitled. Okay. We're currently not paying for anyone, and we've paid for very few this year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, another question for you, Commissioner, just the. <clears throat> highlight the criminal justice reform if i recall correctly when we were hearing this legislation and um and not necessarily in this committee but in in the the house as a whole and also in the subcommittees um the my recollection is that the, pro the projections for where the prison population was going to be was uh was such that it was going to require you to and i think you said this in the, in the big in the big in the large hearing for the full body that it was going to require two new prisons yes. and we were going to have, I don't remember the exact number of inmates that were projected at that time, but I think what can be missed, and I'd like you to comment on it, is that without criminal justice reform, what the trajectory of the prison population was going to be at about this time and versus where it is now. Well, the projection was five years ago that in, F and that in uh, 2016 that our prison population would increase by 5,000 inmates. We did not have the capacity within the system to meet that need. And uh, the recommendation to meet that need would have been to build two new prisons in the state that would house 2,500 inmates apiece. Construction costs for that project was estimated at $264 million. And let me point out, too, that that was just construction cost estimate and did not include any operational costs that that, that would certainly require for us. Well, that's, that is significant. I mean, that is a significant savings to the, to the taxpayers of the state of Georgia. Um, and I think... And I don't know, and I don't say this more importantly, but it's also important to note that the that with the reentry programs and the the programs to try to give people a second chance, those individuals have a greater opportunity of trying to secure a job, and uh, and, and and the benefits of having employment and family and stability in the communities. So there's there's an underlying um, secondary positive impact of them not being incarcerated. Um, Mr. Atwood, Representative Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to point out, and 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 uh, we were, you know, all of us have been very, very active in criminal justice reform. I, I spent some time uh, during the break up at the Heritage Foundation, as well as the American Enterprise Institute and the Cato Institute, and they brought out uh, experts in the area. And to a person, they held up Georgia 
uh, and I, I point this directly at the governor and his team, uh, held up Georgia as a standard. And, and these are folks that are unbiased. They're, they look at the numbers, they look at the facts, and they, they roll them out. And uh, uh, I was just uh, very, very happy to be, to be uh, part of that and to hear what they had to say. I'm, uh, I, do you have any, any uh, idea about, because I'm very interested in how this is going to play out. Uh, we have an aging population. And of course, as people get older, they commit less crime. Uh, uh, I would like to see, hopefully, studies that will be done, and I don't know if you know of any yet or who may be doing them, uh, some of the universities, some of the criminal justice professors and that sort of thing, that will be looking at the reforms we did compared to the aging population. My sense is it's going to drive it down, but I, I didn't know if you knew or if you, because uh, I'd like to follow this. I don't know of a study specific to that. Uh, what our it's a little experts, early, I know. What our yeah. experts are telling us at this point, they're, is they're really seeing sort of a flat line with a prison population over the next several years, mm -hmm. and of course we'll be watching that very closely. But you bring up a very interesting point that's 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 true not only of our <laughs> general population that it's an aging population, but also our inmate population is an aging population. Mm -hmm. And as, as we know, as uh, Representative Hitchens knows, as uh, we advance in age a little bit, uh, things happen to us. And uh, so there are costs associated to that as an agency that we're having to deal with, too, because of that aging inmate population. I'm not sure if he was saying something saying some about your, your age. I thought you were a very youthful young man. So. <laughs> um, with that, we'll, let's move on to the 17 budget. <laughs> the, other guy. Uh, the, uh, the the 17 budget starts on page 157 and uh, we'll just work down sort of in line uh, to begin with probation supervision as I mentioned earlier and as you're aware um, a, a new state agency was created and uh, we are moving uh, former employees from corrections into the new agency. And that is, that is a reduction in our budget of $90,863,677. And that's, that's to uh, the, the final piece of the puzzle for the new agency is to be stood up and operational is to have its own budget. And uh, that was our, our cost associated with the probation services. Um, next is security officer recruitment and retention. Uh, the governor has recommended $23,552,541 for that. It, it is the biggest issue and concern that I have from a public safety standpoint uh, for us as an agency. Um, in 2009, the turnover for corrections officers was 16%. It has increased every single year since 2009. And in 2015, it is 32%. And just real world for what that means to us, that's over 2,000 corrections officers a year the last two years. A tremendous drain on us as an agency in time and effort and funds. And uh, it's also a concern for us losing the experience and knowledge uh, and having a much younger, more inexperienced staff that's having to deal with a much more violent prison population. So we're, we're appreciative of the governor recognizing that as an issue. Uh, we feel that these funds would uh, really make a significant difference with us as an agency and our ability to recruit and uh, retain corrections officers. Regarding education, uh, there's a total of $4,343,227 for educational and vocational enhancements. Included in this is uh, funding for the continued expansion of our welding and diesel and CDL programs. Uh, we're looking at where are the jobs in Georgia and 
tailoring our vocational training to where those jobs are so that hopefully as people are released they'll have uh, better opportunities to uh, to find jobs uh, related to academics uh, increased uh, funding for classroom instruction for adult basic education and literacy programs funding for the high school initiative which in 2015 saw 30 inmates graduate with a high school diploma versus just a GED certificate we're also asking funding to expand our GED fast track program and all 13 of our transition centers and um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, the Technical College System of Georgia is partnering with us to uh, assist with the county education program that we had sort of briefly mentioned earlier. There's $1,325,000 to incentivize the county correctional institutions to provide educational and vocational programming that are in line with criminal justice reform efforts. Um, continuing on, uh, pharmaceutical cost, um, requesting an increase of $3,729,131 to cover pharmaceutical cost. The cost of the top 100 drugs used in our health care efforts have increased by 155 uh, percent. As mentioned earlier, our aging prison population, um, 20 percent of our prison population is over the age of 50, and they, uh, they uh, are responsible for 55 percent of the claims that we have. 18 percent of our prison population are our mental health and 38% of our prison population have been diagnosed with chronic illness. Those are all the uh, agency specific changes. Uh, in 17, there are some statewide changes. If, if you want me to continue on, Mr. Chairman, with those. Okay. Uh, in the statewide changes, there's a recommended increase of $17,602,797 to provide a merit-based increase of 3% for employees, a recommended reduction of $1,857,915 for other st statewide changes related to funding for Human Resources Administration within DOAS, reduced insurance premiums managed by DOAS, and a reduction in billings for Teamworks Administration. And that's all for uh, FY17, uh, except for our capital outlay request. And uh, if, if it's the chairman's pleasure, we'll just go ahead and mention those. Or um, You have uh, in front of you a description of our recommended uh, capital outlay projects. Uh, the majority of those center around repairs and renovations and hardening of our facilities and operational needs. The one item that uh, I feel needs to be mentioned is the design and construction of the Metro Reentry Center. Uh, another tenet of criminal justice reform and the Georgia Prisoner Reentry Initiative is to house inmates near their community prior to release to aid in reach efforts so that those uh, inmates will be more successful when they are released. They're going to go home. That's, that's just uh, the reality of it. And in the metro Atlanta area in 2015, there were 6,988 releases. And we currently have transition center beds for 1,095. And so we're, we feel the best strategy to address that need is to remission the closed Metro State facility, the old Metro State prison, to house those inmates to allow for that reentry, uh, in reach effort. And Mr. Chairman, that, that concludes our presentation. We are uh, fully support the governor's budget recommendations, and, and I'll go a step further than that. We're excited about the governor's uh, budget recommendations, and we look forward to working with the two committees. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, a couple of questions, and I'll turn it over to the members of the committee. There are <clears throat> 
On page 159 of the big budget, uh, item number five talks about increased funds to provide for additional salary increases for security officers um, to address recruitment and retention issues in the highest turnover job classes. This is the same line item that occurs throughout yes. each of the um, departments, if you will, or, or subsections of the Department of Corrections. The question is, in the um, Department of Administration, what are the retention problems that we see there that would justify fifty six thousand dollars in, in in additional pay uh, for those those particular individuals well to begin with it's um, the majority of the requested increase goes to our frontline officers uh, the vast majority of those funds uh, the issue is if if you raise uh, entry-level salaries, those frontline officer salaries, and you don't make those increases with the rank structures above, above those, then you create a salary compaction issue. And, and quite often you'll actually have uh, supervisors making the same or less money than the entry-level folks. And so uh, what we want to do is to look at these funds and uh, you have entry-level salaries uh, mandated by the state. We want to look at target salaries that we feel will be more competitive in all of these, all of these job classifications and, and try to move our employees with this funding and the 3% increase on top of that to those target salaries as close as we can get to them and so that we've got a competitive salary structure not only at uh, the entry level but up the ranks too. Okay. And then another question, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over for other questions from members. The, my calculation is that you've got about a 5%, uh, showing a 5% reduction in terms of um, since 2012 in terms of the inmate population. Um, and I may be off on my math there, but that's, that's what I was calculating based upon the, the uh, slideshow. Uh, the slide that is number, well, uh, it's a slide Georgia prison population. So um, if you're seeing what over the period of time have we seen in terms of a corresponding budget reduction that cor related to the reduction in prison population, and then maybe reasons why you, there is not. But um, I'd like to know if that has been factored in over time and if, and if it has not, why? Uh, it has, and the reality is that at one point we were, we were triple bunking and housing inmates in conditions that probably long term were going to cause issues with us with uh, federal oversight. Uh, we've been able to get down to our truer capacity now. And uh, most of our facilities, we're, we're uh, and I'm going to ballpark this, we're probably about 95% capacity. Uh, we have looked at that uh, as we have looked at the programming needs and, and that smaller prison population. We have actually, we're in the process of uh, evaluating, converting some of those positions that were correctional officer positions into counselor positions and support positions that would better meet our programming needs. Okay. Chairman Huffstetler. Commissioner, on your uh, facility hardening, I was wanting to get maybe a little bit more detail. And, of course, the the first one, which Greg and I lived through, I think, three years ago, was Hayes present up in my district. He was tired of seeing me during that time, <laughs> I think. But uh, And if I remember right, that was about $2 million, and I think it's been successful. Now, we've since rolled it out to the other close level. Is this still in the close level here? Is this more medium security? Or, or kind of give me some detail on that. Uh, we, we've done our close. We're working on our large mediums now. Okay. And, uh, that's, uh, and you could actually, as the hardening was completed in our close facilities, you saw uh, confiscation of weapons and assaults. You could see a difference there. And, and then it became the large mediums became our sort of our pressure point and our issue. And so we're working on those now. And, and most of these funds will go to those medium security facilities that we're requesting. And it's where our issue is now. And so you're seeing with the, with the new furniture that can't be modified, you're seeing a lot less weapons, it's, I would has, assume. It has made a, a significant difference, yes, sir. 
And um, I've always got to ask about cell phones, um, technology. Uh, wh how are we doing on that? I know we we have better success in some places than others. It seems like. Well, it's uh, there is the reality is there is uh, no one solution to fix the issue. I believe uh, I th I think we have really made it a uh, priority within the agency uh, over the last uh, year. Actually, over the last two years. And um, it's a combination of the use of technology, and it's also, it reverts back to training and how we uh, supervise and manage our own employees, uh, sadly to say, coming in of our, our facilities because there is an issue with our employees bringing in those cell phones. But it, it's, um, uh, it's something that's a high priority. We meet once a week to discuss what we're doing and how we're managing that uh, through netting, through camera systems. Uh, we're evaluating other technologies through scanners, body scanners. Uh, for us as an agency, uh, training, uh, better policies and procedures to actually uh, manage confiscated items uh, once they come in our possession. Uh, we are hopeful that with some additional funding and the ability to have a, a higher entry level salary that we will be able to recruit uh, employees that we'll have less of an issue with. But but I want to say that I'm, I'm confident that the majority of our officers are hardworking, dedicated officers, and unfortunately, you always have those few that create the issues and, and get you in the newspaper and, and on uh, television, and, and that's what we've seen. Uh, in fact, this morning at 6 o'clock, uh, working with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI, uh, we, we did a roundup with them, which includes uh, it's a total of 54 federal indictments. Uh, it includes 15 former uh, corrections officers. And I think it shows the, the dedication that we have to address this issue and, and to uh, get a much better handle on it than we do at this point. But I think we're, the emphasis that we're placing on it is truly making a difference now. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Homer, it sure is a pleasure to hear you up here um, as I guess probably the senior member on this subcommittee for years. It sure is nice for a change to be able to get direct answers from somebody that sits in that seat. Well, you know, I've uh, got almost 40 years in law enforcement and we tend to answer questions as asked. <laughs> you're a good man, you're good staff. I'm glad to see Corrections is getting back into the mode. Uh, a lot of the stuff has been hashed out and thanks to the governor's budget recommendations number one issue is to get our uniformed officers get their pay scale up it's not true that this will uh, hopefully this will take care of some of the problems of contraband and things such as that and make better employees out of these folks yes yes sir, that's very true and, and a point that hasn't been made with this is one of the realities of and I think it's one of the underlying issues that we have as an agency with this large turnover is that we've been forced to promote people into supervisory positions when they truly probably weren't ready for that. And that creates a whole nother level of issue that we're having to deal with. And, and, and I've used this example. I, actually, I used this example with the governor several months ago. I went in one of our facilities went into a dorm. There were 70, 72 inmates in the dorm. There were two corrections officers in the dorm managing those 72 inmates. And the officer that was in charge, I was speaking with that officer and, and I asked him, I said, how long have you been working with, uh, with the department? And the answer was nine months. That was the officer that was in charge. And I asked him what they did prior to coming to work for corrections. And uh, I won't mention my name, but they had worked in a fast food restaurant. And that, that's sobering to me. All right. The, uh, oh, the $23 million is being recommended. Now, will this be specifically just for the correctional officers, no staff? Not the, uh, only, only our certified staff. So only certified staff. That's correct. 
Very good. A couple of other questions. Transition and reentry. I notice we're expanding to open up some more transitional beds. With the uh, implementation of the new uh, community based services department, um, do y'all, are y'all able to or have the resources or find the resources to do y'all's end of the transition uh, and the reentry to getting them prepped before they come out? I think a lot of uh, progress has been made in that uh, area in the last few months. As you know, the governor uh, has moved uh, that effort into the the new Department of Community Supervision and having that reentry component with them and allowing the two agencies to work together, I think is more effective and efficient. And, and I would think that Commissioner uh, Nails would say that uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress within the last several months in, in communications between the two agencies and, and looking at how to best use that reentry effort for the most benefit specifically to try to get your folks ready when they're get, yes, go get them through the transition program yes, so sir. that they're ready for the reentry program yes, once they get once they get correct. out and, and for supervision. us really really and truly for us the, the way we have to look at it is reentry starts the day they come in our system and it starts with a classification of those inmates and as we identify the needs for those inmates a couple of the questions if you don't mind mr chairman I noticed that uh, something was said by, at the other end of the uh, the bench a while ago about our mental health or our, our seniors, our geriatric patients. A couple of years ago, we were working on something about uh, renovating Bostic uh, down there to come up with a different way that we could tap into uh, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid funds for these geriatric uh, uh, prisoners that we have. Can you address that, how that's going? Is it still on the books? Is it still in the works? It, that was going to be sort of a joint project, a public-private partnership, and uh, that uh, property has been sold and is now under private ownership. And l let me say that it is not a new concept for inmates to be released into nursing homes and, and their care be provided through Medicare, Medicaid. There are nursing homes in the state now that take those inmates and there are a number of those already. The person that bought the uh, property in Milledgeville, his intent is to build a new state-of-the-art nursing home there and he hopes to cater to those inmates uh, that are being released uh, with those medical needs and we have met with him and we have met with pardons and parole and uh, we think there are a lot of opportunities there and uh, we're, we're sort of excited about that. Uh, he plans to be open uh, sometime later this spring and uh, again we're already working with him now to see how we can best utilize that facility. Very good. One last question. You know we've made so many changes uh, Thanks to this governor and this administration, some common sense changes. Uh, for some of us who have been around here long enough, we watched the, the budget bloat and escalate uh, with uh, a lot of the laws that we had passed and the incarceration rate. One of the things that I've always had an interest in and always like to periodically bring this up, and that's about possibly any plans about the expansion of county camps. County, and the reason I say the county camps is that, you know, we lock them up, we put them in prison. Uh, and because of the rules about who can work, who can't work, and the such. And I think we've I've talked to some of your folks over the last several years about this. Probably one of the best programs that we have is where we have camps where inmates can go out and work. They work the roads, they work the courthouses, uh, any and all things. And, you know, we've been the recipient up in northeast Georgia of a couple of facilities up there. Whitworth and uh, Arringdale and some of those and you know a few years ago we thought the world was coming to an end dealing with our local officials our local county and city folks when we transitioned those from male to female mm -hmm. and lo and behold two or three years later we come back and they say God they wouldn't trade the female prisoners for the males it's a little bit more uh, specifics that has to be dealt with but they tend to be good workers but these folks are just uh, they do a good job, and it's a good way, and it's curious how many 
curiosity, how many county facilities do we have right now? There are currently 23 county facilities, and, and of course, we're, we're always willing to sit down and, and discuss options with any counties that, that do not have a program, that have an interest in a program, and, and uh, that's something we would certainly entertain. And they would have a little bit more latitude than our state prisons where the inmates go out to work. Well, that's, there's, that's uh, sort of the benefit that the county derives out of those uh, arrangements is that we, arrive, we get a benefit in having a reduced uh, per diem for that inmate per day, and the county gets a benefit from having uh, the work associated with that, and the, and the inmate gets a benefit from learning a vocation, a job skill. And what, what the 17 budget asked for some educational funding to go to those county camps so that we can add in some, some not only vocational but some academic education too. Are we having any interest from many of the any counties today or any local yes, jurisdictions yes, interested in going back into the old county camp business? Uh, I'm not familiar with any that have uh, reached out to us in the last year. But, We've had a few ask for expansions, but they've been our larger ones, mm -hmm. our Gwinnett area, other places. Uh, actually, some of our smaller ones have talked about restricting back, actually, so it's been a give or take, Mr. Chairman. Very good. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if I might, I'm, we've run about 10 minutes longer than we planned. To I'm fixing to close it down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> and thank you, Commissioner, and to all your staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Caldwell. Commissioner, I want to ask you, Will, you're asking for money for the metro area to uh, retrofit that facility for reentry. What are we doing for the rest of the state and where they're being housed? Um, we, we have looked at that as an agency, and we have, uh, let's see, we've got a total of 13 transition centers in the state, uh, which uh, is uh, combined is 2,667 beds, and we have actually, uh, we have flipped some facilities to meet uh, needs that we weren't able to address, and we're always open to those conversations. Uh, the great need and, and the large percentage of our population, prison inmate population, is, is associated with Metro, and that's the highest level, largest need we have at this point. But if we identify, as we work through the new agency and uh, the reentry efforts, if there are specific other areas where that may become an issue, then we'll certainly, together, we'll look at those and uh, look at cost-effective options to try to manage those. Well, is the answer then that there are no others except Metro? Well, we, what? we got five dorms uh, currently that we're looking at. We're, Where are they? So I guess the answer, though, is there are no others except Metro that sets as an independent facility to itself. That, that would be the case if, the, if this is approved, yes, sir. Well, then my last question is if Metro can get it, why can't the rest of us get it? Well, uh, again, based on need, if that need is identified, then sir, we're certainly welcome to those conversations. <clears throat> Mr. Chris, maybe you can follow up with some numbers that are area specific in terms of geographically around these other prisons in terms of reentry and see what see if that sheds some light on it. And we'll be glad to get with you and look if you have a particular interest or or a concern for your area, we'd love to sit down and talk with you about that. Years, I probably sent more people to prison than anybody in state. <laughs> 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 Very big interest for my part of the state. Okay. All right. We'll we'll get with you and, and discuss that. Be glad to. Florida Rogers. <laughs> but he is next. <laughs> Go ahead. Commissioner, good morning. Appreciate you being here. And uh, I'm going to re echo Chairman Powell's sentiments about the candor and, and, and the way you answer the questions. Appreciate that. Just a real, real quick thing. Um, Yesterday, when we were talking with uh, the colonel and when we were talking with Director Kanan, one of the, one of the things that they expressed was the concern of looking forward to hiring new people. I know we're putting things in place to retain people and to do this and to do that. But they, uh, 
and it seems to be something that we're seeing not just across the board in law enforcement, maybe more so in, in the law enforcement aspects, but even in private society, finding good people. Are y'all having a hard time looking ahead to try to find people? And if so, what are you doing? I know I see you guys at job fairs, things of that nature. Um, could you just real briefly, you know, first of all, answer the question, you guys find a good people to work for you? And then the second thing is, um, what are, you, what are you putting into place right now to try to eliminate some of those problems? We, we need more Bob Plemons coming up is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, it, it's an issue for us as an agency. It's, it's an issue for us as a state and as a nation, I think. I think it's honestly it's indicative of the times. And uh, law enforcement is uh, sort of uh, taking it on the chin right now. And uh, that does not aid us in our efforts to recruit and retain people. It's a difficult job where you have people looking over your shoulder all the time and you're making split-second split decisions and people are spending months and years evalu you know, evaluating those decisions, so it's difficult. As an agency, in, in the past, uh, there was a real emphasis in looking with uh, prior military uh, we've been very successful with that. I want to continue that. Uh, I think we probably concentrated uh, solely on that too much, and I think the way that we can be more effective moving forward is to not only recruit prior military, but uh, to look in uh, uh, vocational schools, a lot of vocational schools now have two-year criminal justice programs, and I, I think those people in those programs would be uh, uh, prime candidates uh, for, for us for employment. And I also want to look in um, these, uh, they call them pre-service, uh, people that are paying their own way to uh, go into police academies that, that want a career in law enforcement and don't have jobs. And uh, I've spoken with uh, Director Wigington at the at Gypstick, and uh, I want to tap into that and then get our information to those pre-service folks about potential job opportunities too. And I see those as two of the big areas for us to expand into that we haven't in the past. <coughs> Chairman Tibbins. Commissioner, I appreciate what you're doing in the prisons. I had uh, two questions. What is the total dollar value of the services that are being transferred to the new agency? Is it what, 97, it's 98 million, somewhere? There? 90. I noticed there were several line items, but I don't know whether I didn't see a consolidated number. Ninety million eight sixty three six seventy seven. Ninety. Okay. Yes. Sir. Um, that's that's this year. Yeah. Okay. Because one hundred fifteen million when you count what was transferred yeah. last year. If you count what was added last year, transferred is a total of one hundred fifteen million, but ninety million this year. Okay. Now you're talking about this year in terms of FY sixteen in the amended, 17. or are you talking 17. about in seventeen? The, the, the 115 is a combination of 15 and 17, or 16 and 17. Okay. Second question. I saw several line items on merit based pay. Have, have you identified a metric that you're going to use to make that determination? Well, we. Yes, sir, we have. We, uh, we're still. We, we don't have a specific dollar amount. We're waiting to see what's uh, what's actually appropriated, and then we will know that. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at our greatest needs and uh, how we can move current employees to a to a, uh, a a new salary and whatever. What we want to do is uh, whoever the lowest paid person is in that job class, we'll look at that potentially as our target salary to hire at that beginning at that level moving forward. And uh, that way we move sort of, the, the boat rises that way with uh, all of our certified folks. And again, this is only certified employees that we're referencing. So you don't anticipate merit-based being on individual performance, but basically supply and demand in there, the job market? Well, sir, there will always be, uh, 
there, there'll be stipulations that go with those increases related to meeting job expectations. That's the way it's been done in the past, and that's the way we'll do it moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Chairman Stone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner, for all the good work you do for the state of Georgia. Um, I'm interested to know um, how many of that 50,000 some odd population are enrolled in training programs or GED programs, and, and what are your goals? Um, I, I think roughly in academic programming, we have on a daily basis about 5,000. Um, our uh, Georgia Correctional Industries uh, programming and uh, employs, uh, if that's the correct term, about a thousand inmates a day. And uh, we're, we're hoping uh, on the job training programs, uh, in November of 2015, we had 2,323. Uh, that's an increase from November of 14 uh, of over 100 percent. We were at just over 1,014 and now we're over 2,315. And so as we prioritize those and look at those, those numbers continue to grow. Do you have any idea of uh, what the capacity needs we're, are? That's actually something internally as an agency that we're working on and discussing now. And to be perfectly frank, it's been uh, harder to get that answer than I thought it would be, but we're going to have it pretty shortly. Thank you. <laughs> I have let it, I've let us run over quite a bit, and I apologize to the agencies behind. Um, we have some cushion in our time, so we're trying to uh, include that. But I have one last question I need to get an answer to before we, um, and I hope this will resolve any of the 2017, so we don't need to call you back, but we may. Um, and that is, and with all the increases that we're seeing, both merit-based and, um, and baseline salary increases across the board program, does the state have any obligation to look at what commitments it has in terms of payments to private pri to the private prisons um, that we contract with? I think there are four of them, and so I'm just curious as to what uh, the state's view is on that. Uh, in last year's budget, there was um, funds provided to uh, for those private facilities to compete for to enhance educational programming so there was an opportunity for them to um, find additional funding uh, outside of just the per diem cost per day to house the inmates but currently in this budget we're, we're not requesting any increase for them and, and I'm certain at some point in the future that that will be something that we will have to look at and consider but there's nothing in requested in uh, 17 for that Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you, Greg. Good to see you both. Um, appreciate your time. Um, thank you for the men and women of the Department of Corrections. We appreciate the hard work and the challenging job that they have. Thank you all. Pleasure to see you. <clears throat> with that, we'll turn it over to the Department of Community Supervision. <clears throat> Excuse me. This will be on page eight, uh, 85 of your amended budget book. <clears throat> We're looking for Commissioner Mike Nail and Financial Officer Robert Orange. We welcome you all to the podium. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Robert Orange is passing out a handout uh, as we go through. And we, too, will be prepared to go into 17 if that's the uh, wishes of the uh, committee. All right. You've heard reference to uh, many references to the Department of Community Supervision. It is uh, a new state agency. Uh, we've been in operation in, in six months. And so uh, what I'd like to do, if it pleases the committee, is to just provide a, a brief overview of the agency and exactly what it's charged to do, where we're at, uh, where we've come from, and where we're headed, if that pleases the committee. If you look on slide two of the presentation when we talk about our mission, vision, and values, uh, that really set the stage going forward. And without uh, being very 
lengthy in this. Our mission is, is simply said, not simply done. If you've been to prison, we want to do everything we can to keep you from going back. And if you've not been to prison, we want to do everything we can to keep you from going to begin with. Uh, our vision is very simple. It's to be the best. Uh, you've heard reference to Georgia being held up as a national model for ju uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, we're an integral part of that system. We understand we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, it takes great partnership with corrections, as Commissioner Bryson's Bryson alluded to, as well as, par as parole, as well as all of our stakeholders. So uh, we're, we're in it together and, of course, driven by core values of any good agency or organization. Our budget programs basically fall into four areas. We have uh, administration, you'll see outlined there on slide three, field services, as well as misdemeanor probation oversight, which came unto the uh, purview of uh, community supervision. And also the governor's also transition support and reentry back in October. Governor Dill uh, decided to take that and move it under the umbrella of Department of Community Supervision. If you'll recall, when the uh, Office of Transition Support and Reentry was created, uh, Department of Community Supervision didn't exist. So now that it does, uh, for efficiencies and effectiveness, uh, that seemed to be a better fit. On slide four, uh, and I mentioned this on, at Tuesday's presentation, uh, probation was aligned by 49 judicial circuits and 10 judicial districts. They were aligned statutorily. There was no statutory requirement for parole districts, so it just made sense to absorb the parole offices into those di districts uh, as they were already set. So you'll see we have two regions, east and west. Uh, the reason for doing that is it broke up that metropolitan area. Otherwise, if you went north and south, uh, the majority of the north time would be spent uh, dealing with issues in the metro region. So the left, right, or east, west, uh, served better, 10 judicial districts, 49 circuits, and throughout the state we have 110 offices, 11 uh, which are state-owned. Slide five, we had staff coming over from Department of Corrections as well as State Board of Pardons and Paroles as well as other entities. Uh, we had a total of just over 1,600 sworn personnel that came over from DOC, I, I, I apologize, nearly 1,300, uh, and then we had an additional 360 that were counselors and support staff, so, so just over 1,600 from corrections, which you'll see that in the budget in a moment. And then from pardons and paroles, we had 414 sworn staff, and we had 66 non-sworn, so total of about uh, just over 2,100 staff uh, that represent our agency now. We had 155,000 felony adult offenders under probation supervision and 25,000 on parole supervision. So right at about 180,000 uh, were charged with the responsibility of supervising and effectively managing in the community. On slide six, there are several accomplishments there. And, and while we're limited for time, I would like to just hit on several that have been what I would refer to as, as very heavy lifts and a great job and compliment to the staff uh, throughout DCS and partnering uh, with corrections and paroles and our stakeholders to make it happen. Uh, when we combined, you had a parole chief and you had a probation chief, and you know as well as I do, you can only have one person in charge. It's going to be held accountable at the end of the day. Uh, we convened stakeholders in those local communities to include uh, the judiciary, law enforcement, faith-based community, uh, citizens. Uh, they actually determine of the two who was going to lead in their community for community supervision. And I got to tell you, it, it was, uh, the, the result was excellent. We have strong leadership in the field amongst our, our coordinating chiefs doing a, a superb job. Uh, also, we, with misdemeanor oversight, we have uh, developed a website for applications for registrations and audits. Uh, that was not in existence, and uh, there's a high degree of a desire to have accountability and transparency in misdemeanor supervision uh, or oversight of it. Let me be clear that Department of Community Supervision does not supervise misdemeanors, but we are charged with authority of, of overseeing it through the Department of Community Supervision Board. Uh, we also have already established our long-term strategic plan three to five years out going forward, as well as our 12-month operational plan. 
Uh, I'm pleased to say that we have published our first annual report as required by the statute. Uh, specifically, uh, we identify in that uh, annual report what we're going to measure to determine if we're doing what we're charged to do, and that is to have a positive impact on reducing recidivism. So we have those performance measures laid out there so the public uh, and certainly the legislature can see how we are doing and how we can measure ourselves towards that goal. Also, uh, I want to take a moment to compliment our Chief Financial Officer, Robert Orange. It's hard enough managing one budget. Uh, Robert has been managing three budgets. Uh, we've been operating within corrections, within parole, and within Department of Community Supervision, so there's probably no one uh, ready for July 1 to get here more than uh, Robert is, but uh, it's, he's just done a great job as well as staff across. Also to the same thing with information technology, part of the consolidation was to put uh, IT or information technology in Department of Community Supervision. As you might suspect, there's a lot of disconnect and, and disjointed systems out there. So we also provide service not just to DCS, but also to the State Board of Pardons and Proles, to misdemeanor oversight, and what was formerly the Officer Transition Support and Reentry. All of our officers uh, have been equipped with Chromebooks. Uh, Android devices and working off of a singular system that will actually be web-based with portal access with folks that are even outside those respective agencies that had a, have a need to come in uh, to our system. It can be done through the web portal and that is a huge, huge step uh, in the process and that has uh, been done because we're working off of uh, Google applications for government. Just a few of our ongoing initiatives on page seven. You'll see many, many outlined there. Probably one of the biggest lists is our uh, creating agency policies. We have 299 policies under review that we're having to merge. Uh, while that's a challenge, it's good. Uh, I think it's clear probation was doing some very, very good things, as was parole, and now we have the option and the uh, obligation to look at which one was actually best and most effective and efficient and perhaps even combining those. I mentioned our performance measures and our district realignments, cross-training and merging of caseloads, so working off of one assessment. Uh, we're moving away from whether or not you're on parole or probation. Uh, a lot of these people, our offenders, will come out of prison, they'll be on parole, and then they'll go to probation. Some will come out of prison and go straight to probation. In our eyes, their legal status is not an issue. Uh, they're charged with, uh, under our supervision, to supervise whether they're parole or probation, and that's what we'll do through a single assessment and single supervision plan based on their risk need. Also focusing heavy on succession planning and increasing retention. In the next five years, uh, over a third of our chiefs will be retiring. Uh, that's significant. I heard Commissioner Bryson talk about that. I would have to echo, too. I think sometimes uh, I, I know when I was in the field, it was about 15 years before you got into a management uh, position, and now it's not unheard of within three years you're in that same management position. Uh, I'm not suggesting that they're not qualified. I am suggesting that I think we as an agency can do a better job in preparing them for uh, those roles and those positions. Also, uh, I mentioned the web portal and then the onboarding of over 2,000 employees to a uniform labor and travel system. That's no easy feat also. On page eight is really where we're headed to. Uh, it's a huge paradigm shift. Uh, you know, used to it used to be an officer and offender and that relationship was between those two and you really didn't let anybody else come to your business. Those days are gone. Uh, we understand now that if we've got resources that can benefit that household, Regardless of whether they're on parole supervision, probation supervision, uh, we've got a duty and obligation to do that. So you'll see there the holistic approach that criminal justice reform has talked about. One officer, one family, and one community. Uh, that's what we're about. We think that we're going to garner a lot more efficiency by doing that. I think you can appreciate the fact that you don't want three resources from the state going into one house doing the same thing. Uh, and that's exactly what this eliminates, hence the reason we don't differentiate whether on parole or probation. Uh, one officer, one family, and one community. So that gives an overview of the agency uh, and, and where we're at. And uh, if it pleases the chairman at this time, I'll go into our uh, amended fiscal year 2016 budget changes.
Please do. One thing uh, regarding the budget to share with you, this is simply realignment. It has a net zero effect. It's just transferring money from pardons and paroles and corrections. There is one item that, that is an ad there that I'll be going over in a minute. But working off of page 85, you'll see for administration, uh, there's a transfer from field services. Uh, these are mainly associated to real estate. Uh, and you'll see uh, just over 40,000 there. Also, I referenced Governor's Office of Transition Support and Reentry of 147,000 that is transferred. So that gives you a total there of just over 188,000. For field services in uh, FY16, is Department of Administration uh, program accurately reflect the cost of, again, real estate? And then we have one time funds for property acquisition for a parking. Uh, area at Memorial Drive in Atlanta. That is the only ad that we are seeking, and that is for a large office in Atlanta that also has a day reporting center and provides numerous services out there. Uh, MARTA is no longer inclined to lease the space to us, so we need to purchase that. We think uh, that's actually going to be a better investment for us that should we go to uh, uh, try to lease that property again, there is adequate parking there. Also, again, the governor's also transition support and reentry. I'd already referenced that. And so those right there, uh, Mr. Chair, really make up for our uh, amended FY16. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Any questions about the amended 2016 budget? Uh, Chairman Hofstetter. The, uh, the half a million to uh, buy the property, what have we been paying in rent there? We have not. It is a it is a office that we will be leasing, and that was part of what we needed to do is ensure there's adequate parking there. We were actually in a in a facility out on Sylvan Road that, uh, quite candidly, uh, is not in a condition that that is is adequate for not just staff but for offenders to report to. So this is associated with the new facility or, or office that we'll be leasing at this site. Okay, so the other facility do we own? Do we lease over there? We, we own that. That was a former uh, Department of Corrections Diversion Center, uh, and, and it wouldn't take much to go out there and see not just the location, but also the condition of that building. It would take a lot more to get that p uh, building up to standards than it will to lease uh, new space. Okay. To follow up on the chairman's question, so what, what you're talking about doing is that you're talking about acquiring parking at a new facility, um, and the lease you were referencing from MARTA pertained to the old facility. Is that correct? No, sir. The, this parking space, uh, MARTA owns it, and they no longer want to lease that. They desire to sell it. Uh, so therefore, we, we need to purchase that parking space instead of leasing it. Okay, so then what, what was the lease amount? What was MARTA charging to lease that property? Two thousand dollars a month. Okay. Did that get it? Yeah. So I mean, if it's if it's two thousand a month, twenty four thousand a year. I mean, it, it's the economics would say don't buy it, except you're saying that you don't know that you can lease it. Is that your argument? Right. That, they, they were wanting to divest themselves of that commercial property as well. Have we okay. have we done an appraisal of the property? You have a, a block amount of five hundred thousand dollars, but. Um, what we're but, no, sir, I don't. so we don't really we don't <clears throat> okay <clears throat> so that may that may adjust is what we're saying when when do we have a when do we have a timeline for the purchase when are you july 1 yes, so it'll be purchased through the um 16 budget and we're not looking to see that money Okay, and then so we won't see this and not looking to see this in the 17 that, budget. That's correct. And there may be some additional residual funds, hopefully, that from a, a very wise and smart purchase of this property. Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Caldwell. Commissioner, I wanted to ask, and I didn't realize that you said you're leasing the building, but you want to buy the parking lot. Is that correct? Well, the, the, the building was a form, I believe, DOT. Uh, location that was in existence, but uh, there, there's not adequate parking there. Is it on uh, my question? Is it owned by the state? Or is it owned by some private individual? It's owned by the state. Okay, well then, I was concerned of we going to lease a building from some private, but then own the property and if we right. lost the I lease, what we would then do? That, that's you answered my question. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Apologize for not being clear on that. No, that's all right. We're getting we're getting it clear. 
we're clearing up that muddy water real quick. Thank you very much for taking our questions on that. Um, any other questions on 16? If not, we'd like to move on to 17. And I've got about nine minutes more yes, for sir. you. Absolutely. And uh, leave a little bit of time for us to ask some questions. Absolutely. On, on uh, uh, page 152, uh, you'll see right there for departmental administration, you'll see the respect, uh, respective transfers and, and budgets. Again, those are uh, zero uh, impact there of $847,000, just over that. Uh, you'll see on page 152 and 153, that's probably the lion's share of the transfer, and that's the field offices and field services transferring over from Department of Corrections. You'll see uh, just over $124 million there. There are some transfers also uh, from State Board of Pardons and Paroles, but again, these were funds already allocated to those agencies that now that we take responsibility for that, they simply transfer over. And then again, on page 153 and 154, the governor's also transition support and reentry. Uh, you'll see the, the transfer there of just over $1 million uh, for that coming to Department of Community Supervision. Misdemeanor probation was previously with the Administrative Office of the Courts. It comes over uh, just over $21,000 being transferred. And then we do, on page 418, have some general obligation bonds to replace 51 vehicles and purchase 47 new vehicles statewide, and also facility repairs and sustainment and maintenance on those 11 state-owned facilities that we do have. You'll see those uh, just over $2.5 million in the bond package. Again, we, uh, we fully support and would ask you to support the governor's recommendation and appreciate the time uh, for both of the respective committees. And at that time, Mr. Chairman, I'll entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we have about seven minutes left. Let's, let me ask a few questions and let other members ask questions as well. Um, explain to me the, the number of cases or uh, persons, either which way that you associate, that were under or currently under probation. Okay, you 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 had. Uh, and let, let's do the numbers. I w I'd like to know the numbers of, of cases slash persons that you have under probation and then under parole as well. So it, those should be two sets, two different sets of numbers sure. if you have them. I I, I do absolutely. If, if you'll see on page five there on this slide, you had about twelve hundred officers coming over from probation. They were responsible for about one hundred and fifty-five thousand cases. Now. Not all of those are under active supervision. That does include their administrative cases, uh, but, but they're still charged with the responsibility of, of keeping up with them. From parole, you had just over 400 certified staff responsible for 25,000 offenders. Okay. And then how many, how many of these cases wind up overlapping? We, we know matter of factly that you had uh, just right at 5,000 that were under probation and parole supervision uh, that were in fact overlapping. When you look at a caseload breakdown, parole caseloads were about uh, 90 cases per officer. Uh, probation, you're about 150 cases per officer on average. So again, that's where we're, we're looking to gain some efficiencies without asking for additional officers, but, but actually increasing the effectiveness of service delivery. But you are asking for five new community uh, coordinators, right? Yes, sir. And, and I'll share with you those, uh, Commissioner Bryson's reference at Georgia Prison Reentry Initiative, those are, are also associated with $7 million worth of grants uh, awarded to the state. Phase one sites, we are up and running in those. There are six sites. Uh, phase two will have five sites, and there's a community coordinator in each one of those sites. And those are federal grants? These are, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Other questions for members? Chairman House Uh Question about, uh, you know, we see the headlines now about the uh, opioid uh, addiction epidemic. Yes, and um, now I sort of sit in between Senator Mullis's area that has all the meth and the other area that has the opioids, but um, I'm, I'm the dividing line there, I guess. But anyway, there's, um, you know, some of the, the newer treatments I've seen out there, non-narcotic, that would uh, help in this area. I don't know the cost of them. Mm -hmm. are, are we looking at anything like that? or? We are, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's, it's clear that the opioid, as well as, you know, with, with the heroin, uh, 
problem, it's increasing. Uh, it's, it's taken a life of its own, much like meth did. Uh, it, it's going to have a lag effect for community supervision. Right now, you're seeing the increase in arrest for that, as well as now the sentencing aspect. So it's coming to us, and we are, in fact, exploring those treatment options, not only in our day reporting centers, but also the utilization of, of different medications for it. We have been in contact with several vendors, as well as looking throughout the nation as to what uh, others are doing. In fact, I it was amazing to me. I didn't realize how strong the uh, epidemic was in, in a state like Kentucky. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so we have looked at how they are combating it from a community corrections perspective. Absolutely. So you, you might look at even a, a pilot study or something or maybe something like that. There was um, $89 million is reflected from a transfer in from DOC. Um, and I'm looking at page 152, line item 6 of the budget. Um, and so, but the Department of Corrections is reflecting a, a $90 million. So that, that this is okay. Is that what it was? Okay. Yes, Any other questions from members of the committee? Well, seeing none, Commissioner, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I doubt. Okay. Com Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Orange, thank you so much for being here today. Other members of your staff, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'll probably want to follow up with some questions with you later on, and we'll see if we have any follow-up questions from members of the committee should we need you to come back for the 2017 budget. Yes, but I appreciate you going through all of it now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, last item is the State Board of Pardons and Paroles uh, with the Executive Director Chris Barnett. And also, uh, Ms. Lisa Reed, I think, is going to be here. Yes. Ms. Reed, thank you for coming, our fiscal director. We're going to be operating off the 2016 governor's budget, page one, 151 is uh, where the numbers show up. And then in your big budget of 2017, if we get to it, it'll be 293, so 151 to start with. And you have a slideshow uh, paperwork given out to you earlier. Go ahead, Mr. Director. Uh, good morning. Uh, First off, I'd like to thank the committee for uh, having us here and, and offering the opportunity to provide some of the highlights of recent changes with the parole board, as well as some of the parole board efforts and the budget re recommendations moving forward. Uh, I believe all the committee members have the presentation that we're going to review. Uh, if you don't, please let me know and I'll, I'll make sure you get one. Uh, it's been talked about several times today already, but, but I'll revisit it just quickly. Uh, the one major operational change in the board's profile is the transfer of parole supervision to the newly created Department of Community Supervision. Uh, to get that department and that transfer started, the governor signed an executive order uh, transferring a total of $10,058,280 from the FY16 parole board budget to the Department of Community Supervision to stand up the IT solutions, uh, budget, and components of the reentry of the uh, services for the Governor's Office of Transition, Support, and Reentry. Uh, following that, the board administratively detached uh, the parole supervision component of the agency to the Department of Community Supervision for the remainder of FY16. However, we retained uh, services as far as providing payroll services and other operational costs uh, with our partners, uh, the Department of Community Supervision. Uh, FY17 budget will contain the final funds to complete that transfer, to completely transfer parole supervision over to the Department of Community Supervision, and we'll go over those numbers when we actually get to the uh, FY17 budget. Uh, the Georgia Office of Victim Services uh, remains housed and part of the uh, parole board's budget profile. Uh, however, they fully support the operations of the Department of Community Supervision, uh, the Department of Corrections, as well as the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. Uh, with these major changes, the board looked at itself and looked at its mission and decided it was time for an update on the mission. I, I've provided the mission there as part of the presentation, but really the key, key three components of that mission statement is that it focuses on public safety, on protecting victims' rights, and also providing offenders with an opportunity for positive change. Uh, the, 
the charge of the board still remains the same, to exercise that constitutional authority of executive clemency in all of its forms, uh, both pre-release and post-release. That is, the issuing of paroles, pardons, remissions, commutations, but also administering the interstate and violations process, including the issuance of board warrants, uh, the conducting of parole hearings, as well as the revocation process. On the next slide, you'll see uh, an updated organizational chart. I, I won't go over it line by line. I know where we are as far as time, but, but it is there for your review, and, and certainly I would field any questions at the appropriate time on it. Uh, our next slide shows some of the recent accomplishments posted by the board and also the way ahead or, or the way we're moving forward. Uh, the parole board posted a 68% parole successful completion rate for FY15, again exceeding the national average. Uh, total releases in FY15 uh, initiated by the parole board were 13,520. Uh, total number of individual board votes numbered 69,200 or approximately 5,800 board votes per month. Uh, inmate related notifications sent electronically statewide to district attorneys, judges, local law enforcement, wardens, and inmates, number 26,512. Uh, during FY15, we were able to uh, hold two Victims Visitors Days in Forsyth and Columbus, and during these two days events, we were able to make contact with 242 victims or, or family members of those victims, as well as facilitate eight victim offender dialogue programs. Uh, we continue our project on our guidelines revalidations, which was funded through the appropriations of FY16, uh, to make sure that our guidelines that the board relies on when making parole uh, decisions uh, takes into account all of the criminal justice reform that has occurred over the last four years and that we have the most usable and updated information when we're making those parole release considerations. Another project we're currently working on is our, our lifer consideration. Uh, lifer considerations are the only inmate considerations that are still done in a paper file format, a paper file being passed from one board member to another board member until a, an actual decision is being made. We're actually internally uh, running a project to get all of those files electronic and have the board continue to make those electronic votes. Uh, that is all being done in-house. In We're not asking for any additional funds to uh, facilitate that project. Uh, moving that into an electronic file brings us to the next step where we go beyond the electronic format into the what we call evidence-based case processing, moving a, a paper electronic process into an intuitive system that will then serve up a case that is most appropriate for release, holding those that have long sentences or not eligible for parole for many, many years, holding those for later and serving up those cases most likely to be uh, uh, considered, uh, favorably considered by the board uh, now. So that's kind of some of the accomplishments of the board, some of the recent changes that we've seen, and, and kind of the way ahead. At this point, I'm prepared to look at the actual uh, budget book as far as FY16. And uh, as stated before, it starts on page 151 of the budget book. And the only change that we have in the FY16 is the statewide addition of $7,676 in the board administration budget program for the Teamworks to offset the, offset the new IRS reporting requirements for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that is our only change for the uh, FY16. Any questions regarding the FY16 budget from members of the committee? All right, seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and go on to the 2017 budget, which is uh, probably equally as simple. Absolutely. I, I will share with you, uh, I'll be going through the budget, uh, through the budget programs. However, all of the changes that we see here are either st statewide changes or changes in reference to the transition from parole to the Department of Community Supervision. Uh, uh, there's no additional money. Okay, no additional money. Um, since it's all statewide, it's uniform across the state in terms of the, the issues that are being uh, addressed, the 3% pay raise, et cetera. Um, look, are there any questions regarding these transfers so we can try to highlight? If, the, if there's one that you want to highlight, Executive Director, then please do so. But otherwise, I think we can try to go right to questions. Uh, 
I, I truly believe all, all that I have here, and I can certainly am prepared to go through all of them, but they are truly the statewide additions or reductions as far as DOS to, uh, merit assessments and uh, insurance. Um, let me ask just I want to point out something to you when you were going through and um, the number of individual board votes this is on your slide um, it says accomplishments and moving forward you know 69,200 votes is a is, is a lot of votes fortunately we don't have to cast that many votes thank goodness though um, but the that's you know that that works out to being 190 votes per day um, so that is a tremendous amount of votes that, for the a board to go through and try to process and, and then process the files and then make a an informed decision on a vote. It seems extremely sig significant in the number. Um, the shift to an electronic process, I think, is going to uh, hopefully will facilitate these votes uh, tremendously. And then the, the question that I have in here is, I think I recall that we had amended laws so that we would allow for the board to to meet is it telephonically um, so that they can make their votes essentially remotely. Am I correct in that or am I wrong in that? Right. Uh, moving it into an electronic uh, voting uh, system, uh, they are able to vote cases wherever they are at, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether they're at home, here in Atlanta, or anywhere in the nation. Uh, as long as they have an internet connection, they can log in, review the case material, and cast their vote. And, so, and, and, the, and the plan is to move into a, a secure uh, website or secure uh, online facility so that you so that they can review those case files in a secure format is that correct absolutely we uh, we have those security uh, enhancements in place uh, again uh, the Department of Community Supervision and Parole share that uh, same IT system so it's an integrated system uh, we also pull information in from the Department of Corrections and again all the security features that are in place for uh, uh, the field for supervision and that case material are in place for the board and their or in the board votes okay thank you executive director um, chairman stone thank you mr. chairman um, how many cases are, are related to um, pardons and commutations as far as per month yeah uh, per month we're, we're averaging somewhere around uh, the 250 commutations and about 60 uh, to 100 uh, pardons per month and and I think it's important that when we say pardons uh, the board considers all pardons from the uh, a felony conviction all the way down to a misdemeanor uh, where someone had a misdemeanor sentence never went to prison maybe even just paid a fine but because of their employment and trying to get some kind of security clearance uh, they have to get a pardon on that misdemeanor crime to to facilitate that promotion or, or uh, obtaining that employment how, how have the changes that we enacted last year impacted your agency on pardons and commutations uh, in fact I, I would say that the the board uh, recognized the, the need for those changes and and we have actually gone above and beyond uh, what was required of us uh, I believe there were a, a number of crimes that were uh, notated that a notice would need to be sent out I believe it was about 43 uh, felony crimes we've now said that all felony crimes we will send out the notification we're not going to decide one way or the other we're going to send it out on everyone so certainly there's been process changes uh, we've handled those internally we have not asked for any additional funds or resources to handle those and uh, and pardons are progressing as they, they are the decisions uh, are rationales being given um, on individual cases of pardons and commutations uh, yes sir uh, the, either granted or denied uh, I think on the uh, granted they are not on the denied I, I don't believe so thank you mr. chairman um, one other question and I, I'm not sure this is will apply to to your department or not um, or the state the state board but the we have um, we had an incident in Locust Grove Georgia where uh, an individual had been released um, he was actually in ice custody and the you know under our victim services programs we normally notify uh, victims of when someone is released from our system 
In this particular situation, however, they had been, this individual had been apprehended and transferred out of our system into the ICE system for the federal. Um, the victims were not notified, um, and this is a victim that was held hostage, uh, had seen his best friend shot and killed as a result uh, of this, in, this criminal, uh, foreign criminal that's here um, and illegally. And then he's released from ICE and, um, and then uh, surfaces somewhere near, uh, and the victims became aware of it. Our local law enforcement became aware of it only through uh, the newspaper reporting. So it, it, the question is, um, does does your victims unit, would they be responsible for that notification? And is there a way to try to work out a, uh, a um, an arrangement with the federal government so that we are, so that our victims here in Georgia are duly notified when the feds decide they're going to release someone from their custody? If, if the parole board has a, an interest in that case, in other words, if we facilitated the uh, transfer uh, from the Georgia State prison system into ICE for deportation hearings, uh, we have our interstate compact uh, unit right. uh, tracks that case, and, and if that case is going to be released, then that information is filtered back to our interstate compact who notifies victim services and those appropriate notifications go out. However, if, if they've maxed out of the Georgia system and they're just transferred over to ICE outside of parole board action, I'm not sure uh, uh, that, that we do have that. However, we can certainly look at that and see if we can set up a system that any release uh, be routed through our victim services so that we can check to see if there is a victim and therefore make the appropriate notifications from there outside of the federal notification. Yeah, I'd like to work I'd like to work with the executive director and probably with um, Commissioner Bryson about that and see if we can work something out to um, have some legislation that try, will try to uh, ensure that victims are notified even if they've been released from another, from another agency, uh, state or federal. Absolutely. Uh, uh, again, one of our key components in our mission statement is protecting the victim's right. uh, rights. And, and in our lifer cases, we have gone out, even if a victim isn't listed or registered, we've actually gone out and looked and see if we could find victims and, and soliciting support from our, our local district attorneys to go out and pull their files and see if they have any uh, information where we can reach out and contact victims, even if they're not registered with us, so that those notifications can be made. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. I appreciate it. Um, um, Ms. Reed, thank you for coming. Any other questions from members of the board? Seeing none, then I will, uh, this time, instead of people walking, I will just uh, adjourn. <laughs> and, um, and I appreciate y'all being here this morning, and thank you for your service to the state of Georgia. Thank you very much.